Uh, just two words to introduce uh, Barbara Formis. Uh, Barbara is a maîtress de conference that means uh, associate professor something yeah. at the University of Paris, uh, Pantheon Sorbonne. Her areas of research are aesthetics and the philosophy of art. She works at the Ecole des Arts de la Sorbonne and she's a member of the Institute of Art uh, on Arts, uh, Creations, uh, Aesthetic Theories. Uh, she's co director of the Laboratoire de Geste, uh, Gestures Lab. Lab. Mm -hmm. After her education in Italy, she studied in the Netherlands and in Paris and was a visiting professor in the US and Australia and many other countries. She had a full training in the field of dance, both practical and theoretical. Her principal book is Esthétique de la vie ordinaire, um, Aesthetics of the Ordinary Life. Uh, she wrote uh, many essays in collected uh, books. Uh, we are uh, principally interested in her pragmatic uh, uh, focus, uh, shown in the article, for example, uh, La Empathique pour une esthétique pragmatiste, that showed how much pragmatism and the philosophy of practices are important to her. This is the reason why we are so glad to have her with us today. Thank you, Baba. The title is The Visuals, Gestures, and Aesthetics of Fluidity. Thank you very much. Grazie mille, Rossella. I'm very pleased to be here uh, with you. It's uh, kind of a nostalgic uh, journey for me because I was uh, a student here and uh, it was a long time that I haven't been uh, able to come back. Um, so the, what I'm proposing to you today is mainly based on artistic practices. So I hope that this will be interesting for you um, in order to see how art practice is also a way to uh, conceptualize and also to ask questions about uh, concepts. So as uh, Rosella said, one of my main uh, obsessions <laughs> is the idea of gesture, uh, which I will try to um, maybe summarize very briefly here. We can maybe talk about it a little bit more, but for me, uh, gesture, a gesture is very different from the concept of action. And in the field of philosophy, uh, there is a lot to do in order to understand how a gesture can be conceptualized um, in a sense without all the historical and uh, conceptual framework of philosophy of action, which is very linked to intentionality and uh, um, individual uh, process of uh, individualization, let's say. So uh, from my research and also reading uh, about gesture and one uh, um, book that I'm very fond of, that I'm translating, the, the small one, Filosofia del Gesto of uh, Giovanni Maddalena is uh, in the Pearson uh, aspect of it, is very important for me. So let's say very um, roughly uh, speaking, a gesture has um, much more of a dose of passivity, uh, as far as I understood, understand it, than the idea of uh, action. So that's why a gesture cannot be understood from the framework of gesture, of action. So today I would like to understand uh, this idea of gestures in aesthetics and in practices of art precisely uh, on kind of um, way to uh, um, 
make a, a counter argument on at the philosophy of action, uh, even if there will be activities, but maybe these activities will be not very efficient or, not, or useless in this case. Um, so there is one uh, poem that I don't know if you can read properly, the wind and sleety rain and all the business of the elements, the single sheep and the one blasted tree and the bleak music from that old stone wall, the noise of wood and water and the mist that on the line of each of these two roads advance in such indisput indisputable shapes. It's actually a poem by Wordsworth that Dewey quotes in the in chapter eight of Art of Experience, uh, the chapter that is called The Organization of Energies. And uh, from there has been, I have been like kind of thinking about the possibility of understanding the aesthetics of Dewey from this metaphor of the river, water, uh, fluidity, permeability, that is actually very um, uh, coherent with his idea of continuity between art and life. So I have like this idea in mind, and then I would like to propose like three scenes uh, or subtitle for how a block of ice illustrates the possible link between pragmatism and artistic process. Uh, so there are three scenes. The first scene uh, you can see here, there's a team of uh, volunteers who build uh, a nice structure in the sunlight around a large urban area. And the structures are nine meters long, three meters wide and two and a half meters high. They have no doors, no windows, so you can't really see inside or go inside. And they are left in the public space for the sole purpose of blending or melting. Uh, the second scene, uh, two women enter the same flat at the same time through two separate doors. One sits on a block of ice, the other sits in the kitchen near a container of simmering, of simmering water uh, with the equal wa volume of uh, water inside at the, of the ice. From time to time, each asks the other the question now. The answer is no, until the ice has completely melted and the water has evaporated. Scene number three, a man pushes a huge rectangular block of ice of about one meter long and 70 centimeters square and 50 centimeters thick. The action takes place over a whole day from nine in the morning to eight, more or less in the evening, as the walk progresses under the double effect of the friction on the ground and the uh, atmosphere and the heat, the ice is reducing volume. So at the end of the walk, uh, there is only a small piece left that the artist pushes with his feet like a ball just before it turns into a line, sort of a simple puddle on the ground. So these scenes, they have in common this material, which is this block of ice, okay? Uh, so the first scene uh, corresponds to one of the most famous happenings by Alan Capro, a major figure of the American artistic avant-garde. As I will come back later, he has been very much influenced by John Dewey. And the title of the piece is Fluids, uh, and is established in 1967 in the geographical area bordering in the city of Los Angeles. And this is a happening that has been repeated many times. This is important because it's not like an event, it's something that can be repeated until really like 2006 uh, when the artist died. So what is fluid? It is above all uh, an, an open collaborative and uh, uh, proposition with no spectators. It is really something that has more meaning of doing something together. Um, and it is uh, also a sort of a work that criticizes the idea of 
the one artist doing one thing to be looked at, but more it has to um, uh, do with the sort of co-creations, co-production and community works, because that was also the period where all the artists were engaged in civic rights movements and political, um, political debate. The second scene is from the same artist much later, um, in 1974, well, not much later, but a little bit later. Um, and he described not a happening, and I will come to that to you, but what Alan Capro calls an activity, which is something that he has been working on in the later part, let's say, of his art, uh, of his activity. Um, so the title of this activity is called Is On Time, uh, and it has been presented not that many times, but that first time was in a Parisian gallery in uh, uh, France. And the title has a double meaning, evoking a play on words between um, punctuality, you know, being on time, but also on time as being like a theme about uh, the idea of time. And the activity is partly based, as these are some pages on, of the book, uh, is partly based on the confusion of the sounds now and no. As you can see, these uh, two uh, pictures, you can kind of guess that the woman is saying now and the man is saying no, you know, by the kind of faces. Um, so the focus is on the activity of the expectation. What does it mean to expect something to, to happen? And the third scene is uh, by Francis Alice, uh, 1977, 1997. And I can show you, so it's called Paradox of Praxis. And then we come back to the, uh, what is it? Okay. I hope the sound works. Thank you. 
Yes, so this is uh, Francis Alice's uh, Paradox of Praxis One, sometimes making something leads to nothing. And uh, he is uh, an artist who now works a lot on children's game and children's uh, kind of cooperating activity. And then there's also um, another part that, you know, it's not really what concerns me here today, but it's called Paradox of Praxis Two sometimes making nothing leads to something uh, where he is uh, on the square, main square in uh, in uh, Mexico City and he stares, he's actually, another title is looking up. So he looks up, he stares something in the sky that is not there. And, and then of course people come and everybody tries to understand what he's looking at. And that, so, it's, so it's a whole uh, um, kind of, uh, work on the urban space, of course, and uh, politically involved. Um, so let, let's come back to this uh, ice block <laughs> and uh, how uh, these um, practices and art practices can be interesting for us. So these three scenes, uh, two from Alan Capro, one from Francis Ellis, they are related, of course, because they use the same uh, material. Uh, but only, uh, it's not only, so what does it mean to use that kind of material? I think that it has to do with a certain idea of art, idea of uh, society, and also a certain type of methodology that is very critical uh, towards the art world as we know it. Uh, it is above all a question of subjectivity, because uh, of course the transformation of the material is predictable, but uh, it is a very um, critical point of view about the subject of the artist to say, okay, you are let, you let the material tell you uh, what to do, uh, so you are, uh, you are under the subjectivity of the material. So in terms of philosophy, I, I think that it's very interesting to see uh, a form of, um, um, how do you say in English, a subjectivation in this? Yes. Subjective. Subjective, no, the opposite. Uh, uh, the subjectivation, the subjectivation uh, to the environment and biological cycles. Um, so and more precisely means to devaluate the importance of the artist's contribution to the work resulting from the creative process. As this methodology also designates some sensitivity, some sensitive qualities that I would propose then the idea of aesthetics of fluidity, something that is fluid and then it changes the material. This has to do with uh, uh, pragmatism uh, from my perspective, because an aesthetic with fluid, fluid contours uh, allows arts to be embedded into ordinary life. Uh, so if these fluid aesthetics or aesthetics of fluidity exist, uh, it is uh, necessarily a critical stance in relationship to a more classical approach uh, of an aesthetics of the solid, let's say, an aesthetic in the sense of the primacy uh, given to the work as something that is solid, as something that can be uh, eternally or perennially kept. Um, and something also, the piece, even in performance art, a piece of a performance or a or a or a piece of theater has to be something that has contours and lines that are firm, that do not melt, <laughs> they, they do not change. Uh, because that is what gives the autonomy, what we call the autonomy of the work of art, in uh, also in uh, uh, relationship to society, right? So the art is in a certain sense autonomous to from uh, ordinary life. So in contrast, the aesthetics of the fluid mixes and is impure. And, it, it, you know, I like also the video from Francis Alice because we see 
the ground we see that is not pure, there is not maybe something that we would like to watch or to see. Um, so there is a sort of porosity there between what is beautiful and what is not. Uh, and also the fluid embraces a creative methodology of pluralistic practice, because most of the time um, the, the, the artist is with other people or confronted with other people that are not precisely there to look at him um, or, or her. Uh, so the fluidity has something to do with the uh, flow and overflow. There is something that you can see also as a type of terminology in uh, John Dewey, evaporation, dilution, permeability, infiltration. So the block of ice is in a sense a, a metaphor for a sort of a concept uh, of uh, the art. Um, so I will come back to this conceptual framework, but also um, in order to understand also the links with the, with, between these pieces or these uh, arts, of course, Alan Capros is the author or the inventor of these two uh, first uh, scenes, right? The, uh, the scene of fluids, the happening, and also on time, uh, the activity. And so, of course, there is a, a relationship there. Uh, but another relationship can be found between Alan Capro and Francis Ellis, because Alan Capro influenced uh, uh, Francis Ellis. Uh, for example, in this other piece that is called, ah, there's something wrong with the uh, <laughs> So the, It's not that. Uh, it's not blah, blah, blah. It's actually written there, um, which is uh, uh, Alan Capro piece that is from 1989 that is that is called taking a shoe for a walk um, and then Francis Ellis uh, did uh, another performance um, that is called the collector which is actually a sort of a dog uh, of uh, magnetic uh, uh, material that kind of collects uh, all magnetic uh, uh, things that you can find on the floor. So there is this idea of art is in the street, uh, the artist is somebody that is not particularly different from other people. So there is some uh, ordinary aesthetics that is there. And so uh, the, the, the both of these artists, they both are critical of museum institutions and like uh, to subvert uh, art, especially Francis Ellis here being even having some police sort of problems because he has been like re reenacting some sort of robbery with a fake gun and you know, in, order, in order to see what actually happened. So it is really um, also a way to trouble, uh, take trouble as a, as a purpose and as a, and as a tool for art. Uh, so but also for both of them, uh, mainly for Alan Capro, there is really a, a direct influence from pragmatism. So this is my way of reading this, is that pragmatist aesthetics and especially art of the experience had an influence on the American scene of the arts, uh, especially in the 60s, because there everybody was reading art of the experience. And in a sense, what the artists were doing can tell us maybe a little bit more uh, or in a different way what uh, John Dewey was more maybe meaning uh, to do. Or and it's not a question of understanding were they actually reading well uh, John Dewey. It's not that. It's, even if they were taking John Dewey in a certain uh, an orientation that is not right, that can tell us something about and going back to uh, pragmatism. So it's a sort of a, through the art to go back uh, to uh, John Dewey's reading of uh, artist's experience. And Alan Capro himself, uh, he has been, uh, this is another happening of Alan Capro, so reading art as experience and also quoting not only John Dewey, but all the kind of conceptual framework for them. There's a whole current for life rather than art. 
that go back to the time of Wordsworth, at least. And it's interesting to see that John Dewey also quotes Wordsworth. Um, to the current that emphasizes art as experience, that tries to bring art back to life. So that's interesting. And that goes through Emerson and Whitman all the way to John Dewey and even beyond this tradition has influenced me a lot. Um, so it's interesting to see that bringing art back to life, because that really means that art for Alan Kapoor was kind of dead at the moment, because things in a museum, from their perspective, they were not alive anymore. So this current of for life, uh, life uh, rather than art, is of course a critical stance towards art, right? Because uh, life is kind of more important. The, at the same time, there were um, Fluxus movement, for example, in France, but also in uh, New York, because there were like two scenes, San Francisco and New York. And there is um, this nice uh, quote from uh, Robert Filiou that says, l'art est ce qui rend la vie plus intéressante que l'art. Uh, so art is what makes life more interesting than art. Uh, so it is really this kind of chiasm between the two that is interesting here. Uh, so fundamentally, pragmatist approach, uh, Emerson Whitman, um, is very interesting for these artists because kind of confirms them in the um, uh, understanding of uh, an embedded art and also the idea of the artist as a citizen, the artist as a person that is related to the society. Um, and so uh, of, they were reading mainly John Dewey, but also I will also be William James, not really Pierce, I'm sorry, <laughs> not, not Mead. Uh, but, you know, there is this kind of American philosophy, American literature uh, that they go uh, also together for them. So I will follow this assumption of a sort of a theoretical terrain of American philosophy in a broader sense and pragmatism in specifically as kind of the uh, field, conceptual field for these artists to um, create. Uh, and so that's why we can also understand uh, uh, the um, an, uh, the art as experience can be understand uh, understood as uh, an another way of criticizing the art with a big A uh, in sort of uh, in order to uh, understand art as a um, as you said with a lowercase A so that the art becomes not an art world aside, but rather a way of being, uh, a way of experiencing life. And it is, so going back to me, my idea of fluidity, art is something that permeates uh, life. Um, uh, art is a kind of an immanent force uh, that is popular, that is democratic, that doesn't belong to institutions, sort of a high, but goes more on the low. Um, also going back, of course, uh, from for these artists to Marcel Duchamp and ready-made and uh, Marcel Duchamp idea that some things have a sort of a art art coefficient, so they can they can be like, like a degree of artistic uh, uh, sensibility or qualities. So the work of art is not, does not uh, belong to the museum or the institution. A work of art can exist and not be being recognized. There is nothing about recognition. People can also not see, and that's, that's uh, OK. Uh, but art extends to a whole series of habits, gestures, forms of life, ways of doing things that aesthetically shape the whole uh, nature of our existences. So that's my idea also when I talk about gestures, they're not acoustic gestures, they can be ordinary gestures having these aesthetically, aesthetic qualities. So if we take seriously the theoretical approaches of the artists 
uh, in their own research, because artists can also be considered as a research, uh, then we can grasp the conceptual and original scope of their aesthetics. Um, in other words, we can also see maybe that with their practices, they were testing uh, the some hypothesis that John Dewey kind of mm, proposed. Um, so artistic research can therefore appropriate the pragmatist idea to practice, to transform it, to prove it or prove it wrong, or to, to um, divert it, to change it. Yeah. And so this is a, a theoretical orientation uh, that makes possible to submit the hypothesis of an aesthetic of fluidity understood as a pragmatic aesthetics. So uh, 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 an aesthetic where uh, practices and uh, ways of behaving and gestures are actually the tool to uh, understand the, the, the art. And so it's an aesthetics that kind of refuse uh, crystallization or solidification, something that stays the same. Uh, and this refusal of crystallization can, um, in a sense, uh, um, make us understand also what the work of art can do in terms of time, forms, and forces. And then we'll come back. So let's go maybe a little bit more into the in details about this metaphor of fluidi fluidity that uh, we can find in Dewey, as I told you before, I showed you the poem of uh, uh, William Wordsworth. But then you can, if you if you read uh, Arthur's experience, there, there are some quotes that I put there that really um, uh, tes testify this kind of vocabulary that uh, uh, John Dewey is uh, using. Art is a quality that permeates an experience Aesthetic experience has an internal organization that functions by a kind of cumulative and fluid conservation. Our activities obey largely external necessities rather than an imminent movement, like that which controls the course of way or the waves. And consciousness is at its most acute and intense when readjustments are imperative and tends towards mm -hmm. zero when contact is peaceful and interaction fluid. It is turbid, turbid when meanings are subject to reconstruction without determined mm -hmm. direction and becomes clear with the emergence of a clear situation. So I'm kind of putting in italic all the fluid or watery kind of terms, permeates, cumulative fluid, uh, waves, and uh, fluid and turbid and clear, so these really are, are qualities of water. So what does it mean for him you know, to use these uh, uh, types of uh, uh, terminology? So from my perspective, it is not just a metaphor. It is also kind of a way of understanding uh, the, the, the concepts. And uh, uh, I think that I have another one. Yes, so this is a very long, from uh, um, having an experience, uh, chapter three, uh, a river as, din as distinct from a pond flows. And there's a lot of times, so I did the occurrence, I can't remember the numbers, but there's a lot of times that you would use the verb flow, something flow overflows. But if flows gives a defined the fineness and interest to exosexes proportions greater than exist in the homogeneous portion of a pond. In an experience, flow is from something to something. As one part leads, no, as one part leads to into another, and as one part carries on what went before, each gains distinctness in itself. And it's very important after the experience, this continuity with what went before and what came after. The enduring whole is diversified by successive phases that are in phases and its varied colors. Because of continuous merging, there are no holes, 
mechanical junctions and dead centers when we have an experience. So you see, it's really like organistic and naturalistic metaphor rather than the mechanic metaphor. There are poses, places of rest, but they punctuate and define the quality of movement. They sum, they sum up what has been undergone and prevent its dissipation and idle evaporation. Continued acceleration is breathless and prevents parts from gaining distinction. This is really very something very important that comes also in experience in nature. That is really the main point for Dewey to um, defend the idea of rhythm. Uh, rhythm has been like a core uh, for the aesthetic experience and uh, very opposed to the Darwinian a biological idea of discharge, for example, something that is not retained. So in a work of art, different X episodes, occurrences melt and fuse into unity and yet do not disappear and lose their own character as they do so. So it is really this variety and unity that he is after. And so as you can see, there is this idea of Consciousness, permeability, fluidity, organization of energies, flowing states, external forces, everything that is actually uh, possible to see in nature, but with a consciousness in it, uh, uh, an idea that uh, uh, has a sort of a theoretical and practical uh, reasoning uh, in a modality that uh, um, allows a sort of a relationship between different parts uh, instead of a, a unity that is a sort of identification without relationship. So this permeability between consciousness and a situation is actually a, an example uh, that pragmatism establishes um, in order to overcome the classical dualisms, right? Body and mind, subject and object, self and other, thought and action. So there is always this idea of uh, relation and difference, unity, but also they not disappearing, right? Cannot really disappear. Uh, and the change is never rapid. Uh, everything has to be slow. There is something that has a certain uh, slow rhythm. Uh, so fluidity corresponds to a sort of a quiet, but also very imperious, very uh, strong um, adjustment with life uh, that, uh, in a sense, uh, makes us make it possible to have like a sort of a... Um, uh, something that is material, but also something that can be, uh, of course, uh, consciousness or conscious or cognitive. But what is interesting also is to see that Dew is very um, uh, critical of any sort of uh, immanence, you know, that we can maybe think about the laws afterwards, right? So a sort of an immanence that has no boundaries, that there is very dissociative or deconstructive uh, of Derrida, for example. So Dewey is really like already almost saying, no, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't go there. And when you, uh, I underline these uh, uh, problems that he can find, there are in dissipation, evaporation, disappearance, uh, which are really when water uh, becomes air. So it, it is really this metaphor also of the evaporation that uh, for him is a sort of a loss uh, because you lose the ground, uh, because you're not fertile anymore, you, you are indeed sterile. So there is a lot of um, uh, possibility in water, but it also what type of uh, fluidity, right, he points out. Um, okay, so this is kind of Dewey or the reading of Dewey with the fluidity. And uh, so what can we say about uh, the artistic uh, 
projects and practices that I mentioned up, uh, before, right? I mean, how can we understand this concept through them? Um, so if we, um, from a pragmatist conceptualization, if we understand this aesthetic of fluidity, then we can try to understand better the critical aspect of this um, type of work of art uh, to designate the experience from the point of view of uh, the pragmatic aesthetics in a sense. So fluidity, but also transformation, but also materiality, they can uh, um, put on, be put on, uh, at work. And of course, these practices, but also from John Dewey, the idea of the artwork is uh, completely redefined. So an artwork is maybe a creation, maybe not. Is it, is it a praxis? I will come back to this. Um, so for Capro and uh, Alice, um, as you can see, unlike Dewey, evaporation uh, happens, right? I mean, it, it is actually what uh, defines uh, their, their art. Um, so for these artists, evaporation of this material, I mean, we can say at least for the, the material itself, uh, is not a problem. We could also say uh, that, especially for Capro, that the disappearance of the work is not a problem because, uh, for example, the on time, there is like this little catalog, but it's very difficult to find pictures. Apparently, on Capo, he kind of threw away all the videos and pictures that he had because he said that is not the work, right? The, the, the artwork kind of be reduced to these images. Um, so there is a, a true um, uh, constructive uh, resistance uh, to anything that could stay, that could mm -hmm. remain, right? Um, so practice uh, can be understood as a uh, redefinition of what the uh, work of art can be. Uh, and so maybe the idea of praxis uh, could be interesting here, you know, because as uh, uh, you remember, the uh, performance of Francis Ellis is called Paradox of Praxis. And so he really uses a term that is not like a common term to use in ordinary life. Um, so for, for, from this point of view, we can understand praxis uh, it precisely as uh, a sort of a identification between the art practice and the work of art. So what does it mean when uh, the two go together? So the, the practice itself of the art is actually what gives sense and what makes that a work of art or an artwork or I don't know if we can still talk about work of art. Um, so in terminology, in philosophical terminology, a praxis, um, as we know from uh, Aristotle, uh, ethics uh, of Nicomachean ethics, praxis is the action that both designates the act and the consequences of the act is the practice, the praxis for Aristotle is different from poiesis, which is uh, the action that has an external uh, meaning or an external end, right? And in the world of the arts, we have been always associating the work of art with poiesis. So a work of art is something that is produced and the technical gesture is a tool to uh, produce the work, right? But here, uh, the technical, well, first, there's nothing really technical about it. I mean, everybody can do these things, uh, but also the, the, the action because, the, sorry, the, the product, because it, it evaporates, then 
he has, in a sense, to give back the sense to the action that is left. So what is left is kind of a comeback of the meaning into praxis, into uh, the uh, action in itself. And, and so, of course, this for Aristotle is a, a, a way to differentiate um, poetic, not only poiesis, but poetic uh, production from political uh, action. Because for Aristotle, praxis is uh, above all a sort of a uh, transformation of the agent of the person who is the subject into the action. Um, so a paradox of praxis uh, is also a paradox of the artistic production uh, because the artistic production is paradoxical in itself. And uh, precisely because there is no poiesis, uh, or at least very little poiesis, uh, but there is a, um, something that is uh, that gives meaning to the agent. So that's why I called uh, these like useless uh, gestures. Uh, they are useless because there is no production, but also the action in itself has no utility. And, and it's precisely because the utility is um, uh, took away from the action that then uh, the sense of the actions can be uh, of course, understood as a sort of a critical, minimalistic uh, uh, as, um, grasp on art. But also, of course, I mean, I think that this is somebody, something that is obvious, but is also very important, difficult to grasp, is that the key concept, of course, here is time. Uh, because it's not just the block of ours, but is the time that passes and the way that uh, temporality is uh, lived through the experience uh, itself. Uh, so what is unusual from these uh, activities is that is the duration of the performance. And it is also sort of a trend in uh, performance art to have like, very long performances and then uh, sort of uh, duration, long duration gives a certain absurdity and also like useless uh, uh, points to the, to the action itself. So performance here uh, is uh, uh, at the same time, the absence of an object uh, that is ultimately produced, but also the endurance of the body. Uh, and this endurance of the body, in a sense, is a way for this artist also to uh, ultimately um, criticize uh, and emancipate maybe the work of art from the economical um, uh, constraints of the art world and the classical habits of merchandising uh, the uh, uh, works of art in a justification of the uh, capital uh, um, exchanges. So this is very important at that period of time, especially to do these kind of practices, practices in order to criticize the capitalistic or uh, uh, merchandising of the arts. Uh, so on time, um, of course, this is the title of the activity in the middle, is kind of very explicitly about that. But what is interesting also, I think, is that um, there is, uh, especially, well, I mean, especially in uh, Francis Ellis, but not really in, from this uh, activity, um, is a relationship to time. There is uh, sometimes like an interruption of, of time uh, or normal ways of using time. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, Francis Alice systematically repeats certain actions, certain routines uh, in attempts to insert uh, art into the neighborhood, into the urban space. 
So, and this in, insertion or interruption can be interesting to analyze. But of course, also this fluid aesthetics um, in, uh, in a temporal way can also be uh, understood from the um, way that we can see in art of experience, uh, because the main uh, uh, ground on which art on which art and life, um, in a sense, share their, their experience or their fundamental ontology is time. So uh, the examples that uh, uh, um, John Dewey gives in, third, in the third chapter, for example, of art and experience, they're all experiences, for example, that meal in a Parisian restaurant, that's one of his examples or that uh, uh, time of crossing the Atlantic. Uh, so that another example. And what is important for him is that these uh, aesthetic experiences, they are, they are in a continuity of time with other experiences. And these other experiences, they become, uh, of course, less interesting or mediocre or boring or uh, maybe joyful, but not in the same way. And that's how the aesthetic experience serves in a way to restructure all the others' uh, experiences, all the other experiences. Uh, so if pragmatic, if pragmatic the philosophy and Dewey's a metaphor of um, temporal continuity can be in a sense considered as a um, a framework for these uh, art practices, then you know we have to understand what is evaporation, what is dissipation, as it as it to, something to do with time, with repetition, rather than uh, because repetition sometimes can signify evaporation in a sense that things do not um, do not have the same meaning. Oh, so where is this difference? You know, where is the difference? How can we say this is aesthetic, this is not aesthetic, this is art, this is not art? And I like the fact that sometimes we don't really see uh, very clearly uh, where the, the, the difference is. Um, so how uh, the can these experiences also make us understand about ordinary life? Because of course, these actions are not ordinary. I mean, you don't go <laughs> pushing a block of ice in the street every day, right? Uh, but that is also what uh, I've been uh, working on is the idea, the difference between ordinary and everyday or quotidian. Uh, every day, of course, is something that has to do with ritualistic gestures and habits and behaviors uh, that are shared in a culture. Ordinary experiences, of course, they have also to do with that, but maybe with less individually, individualistic aspect. But an ordinary experience, I think, that it has to do also with the idea that anybody can do it. So a big, big uh, quality, a big... Uh, character of uh, contemporary art, especially contemporary performance, is all that anybody can do. And it has been also said there's sort of a critique, or oh, I can go there on the stage and do what they were doing. But that's precisely the point, that you can think that you can do it, right? Uh, so it doesn't require any virtuous or very uh, technical uh, skill. Um, so it is really a sort of art that is not artisanal, that is not artisanal, uh, artisanal, it's not technical. Um, so in order to um, understand a little bit better this uh, uh, difference or not difference between art and life, I really think that Dewey can be interesting to uh, we uh, use here uh, about uh, the internal qualities of the experience. How do we experience something? Um, and then the form of an experience, where does it start? 
how does he kind of behave in a in a rhythm and uh, where does he finishes in a, in what way so the form the internal qualities of the experience uh, and also of course the uh, pluralistic uh, potential of these experiences because most of them they can be collectively shared maybe not done together but they can be collectively shared so these are kind of very important uh, qualities of the arts. And the confusion that can be uh, drawn between art and life is precisely what these artists are for. Uh, the essays uh, um, that Alan Kappel put together in uh, this book, uh, which I really recommend if you are interested in to knowing better uh, this kind of uh, uh, artist, for me, is kind of a philosophical book because there are so many little things. Uh, so it's essays on the blurring of art and life. So the idea is really how can we stay in that uh, uh, impermeable, permeable, uh, permeable area. So the line between happening and everyday life will be kept as fluid and perhaps as indistinct as possible. So there again, you have this idea of fluidity. In this chapter, this very interesting because he he's kind of criticizing his own arms. Happenings are dead. Long live happenings. Um, so the line uh, is not a line anymore, uh, but it's more like a relationship uh, between uh, art and life, and maybe a sort of a, a melt <laughs> melting uh, uh, dimension of uh, fluidity. So the practice of the fluid uh, embraces uh, another idea of the work of art, another idea of the art, um, art uh, aesthetic experience, and, and also, of course, another idea of the artist, because, of course, the artist uh, cannot have the same authority uh, on the work and cannot be the creator uh, of this work. Uh, so there is no longer this idea of uh, the work of art as uh, uh, something that is created uh, from uh, uh, the artist. The notion of the author is, um, in a sense, diluted in, in favor of a, a more collective uh, um, exercise or a program that is given to the, to the, to the society. So fluid aesthetics is composed of a set of practices and activities that aims to um, demystify and desacralize the reference to a historical signature of a known artistic movement or a very known cultural institution by underlining, of course, a democratic uh, freedom that art can be done by anyone. And that is really like the political aspect of this artist. So in how much do you have? I'm sorry. I'm going to cheat them both. Okay. Uh, so following this uh, hypothesis, these artists uh, that are kind of hairs from pragmatism, they uh, propose um, this idea of activity. Uh, Alan Kapper talks about activity, and activity is something that is very important for pragmatism. And, and I really think that uh, there is something there very interesting to understand activity rather than action as the philosophy of action, as I said at the beginning. Uh, so an activity, as you can find in Richard Bernstein, for example, underlines the possibility of um, uh, 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 um, an activity uh, mean as a meaning or a value or a truth where um, the activity uh, is realized in a in a sort of a in interaction uh, and uh, so action is never really understood as something that begins from one standpoint but has to be understood as an interaction sometimes as a relationship between being and its environment, which is really something that all pragmatists, of course, uh, uh, think. Um, but also you can see in John Dewey later kind of uh, uh, 
uh, John Dewey uh, with his idea of transaction, which is also something that is very interesting uh, to understand uh, as a sort of a dialectical and multiple movement of different phases. Uh, uh, so it is also related to this metaphor of the river, as you said before, right? Um, and also this fulfillment uh, that we can find in Arthur's experience has to be understood not like a, an individualistic pleasure, uh, like in a hedonistic uh, way, but mainly uh, a fulfillment of the experience itself. And uh, maybe also to be linked to William James um, and the experience of activity where the author asks himself to understand under what condition and uh, one can attribute an activity to oneself. You know, what is the relationship, which is very, very difficult to uh, point. Um, so the activity, I think there is a, an interesting uh, word. And Alan Capro himself, at the end of his career, he stopped doing happenings and he started doing what he called activity uh, with a capital A. <laughs> Uh, and so this is a nice quote that I really like uh, from him. I do not, to use a pietistic term, create an activity, but rather arrange its program. And I think that this verb arrange is very interesting and is so much modern than creation, uh, you know, this idea of the artist as a, as a god, you know, the music, uh, uh, no, you know, there is something that has to be done and the artist is like anybody else. Uh, so he also calls it like an innocent, innocent, innocent game uh, or, the cap or the capacity to produce an experience. So for example, one activity is brushing your teeth every single morning, thinking that your gesture is art. I tried, <laughs> you, it's difficult because after, you know, like after a few days, you forget, okay, I had to think about it. <laughs> and it has, of course, something that is meditative, you know, those are the days where we had New Age and Buddhism, Zen, we have a lot of influences there. But it's interesting to understand where is art, what is art. And most of the time, uh, Alan Capra says, is a sort of a, um, you know, like Duchamp said, like coefficient or like a bank of a notion of what art could be. Uh, so activity becomes a way of fabricating or, or understanding life as something that has a, permea a permeability with art so that it can be seen or can be experienced as art. Um, so it's uh, supposed to, uh, not supposed to be always a pleasurable action. It's not supposed to have an emotional fulfillment all the time. Uh, but the final uh, activity it has its own flow uh, by repetitive and uh, almost unconscious uh, habits. But the body experience allows it to uh, become something that makes, in a sense, uh, uh, something better for the agent uh, instead of uh, putting the agent in a contemplative distance uh, from uh, the world. Voila. <laughs> Thank you very much, you. Barbara. Uh, I don't know if uh, there are uh, some uh, questions. Okay. Ciao Michela. Please. Ciao Barbara. Ciao. Buon pomeriggio a tutti. Grazie. Ok. I I saw a hand someone from someone online wants to intervene or make a question. I have a question. Può parlare in italiano? Yes. Ah, bravo. Okay, I'm um, in. Thank you for your very interesting talk. I, uh, I was wondering if your, uh, your idea of uh, 
aesthetic of fluidity mm -hmm. has something to do with uh, another idea that I I read uh, from another author that comes from Dewey, that is Ellen Di Sanayake, that mm -hmm. uh, um, that uh, from from Dewey, from Dewey, she she tried to build the, the notion of art as gesture or art as something that uh, is practice um, that she calls to artify. Mm -hmm. So um, the difference between uh, the, the ordinary life and something that is aesthetic is, uh, um, is a difference that uh, relates to making something special. And so I was wondering if uh, um, this notion can be somehow similar to what you are talking about, because of course, uh, art uh, comes from the practice, from ordinary practice. There is no um, a difference, a marked difference, an ontological difference between arts with the capital A and ordinary life. So it comes from the, the ordinary gestures, but somehow making art is making something special. So, for example, making a gesture special, an ordinary gesture that becomes something special. I'm asking this because this uh, author, Visanayake, tried to interpret uh, this uh, um, idea that uh, she takes from Dewey, from uh, art as experience, but making uh, an experience special is, means to do in art. She tried to interpret this uh, um, on uh, the Paleolithic part. Okay. So humanities, when, uh, when it emerges from, from the animal world, um, use art as a means to uh, to create something that is unique mm -hmm. for the first time. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, creating uh, that incredible picture from Lascaux is a way to create um, an environment that is special, but not special as an ontological difference, but special from the community mm -hmm. that can go in the dark side, in the dark place, and uh, doing something ritual in this, in this mm -hmm. sense. An so, emergence. Of an emergence. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I was wondering what you, what you think about. This. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I, I have heard of Alice Yasunake, but I haven't really been reading her, and I will. Thank you. Um, I mean, so there are different uh, uh, terms. So for me, art and and also for for from for Dewey, art and aesthetics are um, actually very different. That's why he calls art as experience. Uh, but um, the idea is also that our uh, understanding of what art is is so. Um, uh, influenced by culture, by institutions, by uh, economical uh, differences that um, you cannot really see, I think, this porosity inside this world. But then the paradox is that only people who are artists can say, I'm not an artist. Right, <laughs> and a person who is not is not going to have to say that they are not. So that's what they are playing on. Uh, on Marcel Duchamp, uh, and then also Andy Wallon in a sense, and you know all this trend uh, after them in the new avant-garde. So uh, for me, art has to do with uh, an institutional recognition. Even if it's like a minimal institutional recognition, but that the community uh, sees what this person or even this gesture, because the, some people also they don't wanna give their names, but they exist <laughs> with their actions, right? Uh, but then the aesthetics 
uh, is something that is uh, there all the time, that you don't need art to, uh, to, for the aesthetics to exist, right? It is it's part of life. And, and also, uh, so in a sense, art needs aesthetics when aesthetics doesn't need art, right? It's, it's not a, um, and, and so it's, it's actually very interesting that Isenake goes back to Paleolithic, uh, the hand and the, and the community and the human uh, and the signalization and the kind of, uh, meaning uh, of this and the sign of this hand saying, I'm here, hello, I'm talking to you. There is, you know, there is something. Uh, and it's interesting because it is precisely way before art has been understood with artisanal and uh, cultural aspects, uh, like like now. You know? So, um, but I think that uh, this idea of uh, emergence, uh, as you said, Rosella is very important as well. So how can you understand something is emerging, maybe will not emerge completely. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, in performance art, a lot of, uh, a lot. I mean, there's a trend that is called furtive art. So performances art that are done in the streets, uh, not to be seen precisely, uh, and, and to see what can actually happen if some, something happens or not. Uh, and, I, and I like this idea. Something is emerging, but is also not visible and not to be seen, which is a very difficult thing to do in in a world of the art that is based on the scene. And uh, uh, and then there was this question here mm -hmm. uh, from Edison. Uh, I keep in mind that you said that you're not a reader of peers. <laughs> so, I'm not. Fluidity. Uh, of peers categories, it's possible to understand your aesthetic gesture from the person view. Fluidity is a form of firstness, yes, yes. Materiality is a form of secondness. Yes, and transformation is a form of thirdness in a sense of process of habit formation. Yeah, but the, the problem, I mean, I don't know Pierce, so that I, I, I mean, I, I know a little bit also, I mean, what I, what I, uh, what I don't um, understand if it actually is that, is that there is no one, two, three, uh, because the, 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 the process itself is uh, the, is also the fluidity of the of the first of the spontaneity. I think it is exactly, exactly. So also. Okay. So okay. It's a good idea. Okay. Okay. Well, I will uh, I will look into it. But for 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 what I understood, but not for peers, but in general, um, a gesture is very different from a sign, uh, in the sense that a sign is there in order to uh, be, you know, is, is in there in order to signify, of course, I mean, in, if I do this, uh, this is a sign, but if I do this, it's a gesture, it's not a sign. But this gesture can also have a meaning, but it's a meaning that is not uh, as cod codified or as easily understandable and also as easily translatable as a sign, you know, a sign that says this, I can say yes, and that's the translation in language. For this, you can't really uh, translate. But you know, uh, that's what I understand. But I will thank you, Edison. Thank you for your answer. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very uh, and while you were talking with him, showing all these art pieces, um, it came to my mind a, a book that came out last year. It's called um, "Which I Know Means Violence" from the uh, from the writer who let us know. Okay. Uh, this book is an investigation of art forms which are quite similar to what you presented today. Okay. 
because it is an exploration of art forms which embody uh, sort of destitution of the work of arts. Mm -hmm. But the main focus of that work is the idea of can, can you hear? Can I can I hear you? Yes. Okay, so I'm so the, the, the main focus of it is the idea of disruption and disruption. Yes, okay. and in in the most extreme forms, uh violence as part of this works of art. One of them of the examples that she made that came to my mind because it's very similar to the sort of art that we presented today is the sort of missing field from Harman Korean um, that is called the fight pile. So Han Lee was a very uh, experimental, so to speak, filmmaker interested in uh, bringing actual life in the mm -hmm. viral sort of aspect to the movies. And he arranged a film that was supposed to break the medium of the film uh, because it was a movie without a script. You would basically go to up to people and start a fight with mm -hmm. the people. And the only rules, the, sort of the arrangement of the thing was that uh, the fight can, could not be broken from someone outside of the fight itself unless it was about to be extremely ugly. So the, the, of course, the movie never saw the last day because he got to the hospital like after two fights and the footage was canceled because it was highly illegal. But the point that she makes is that there's this link between the forms of disruption and these sort of fluid uh, frameworks uh, of approaching the aesthetic experience. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, is there a similar, where does disruption fit mm -hmm. in a two-year two perspective? I, I act it mostly because I'm not an expert in the don't do it at all. So I uh, mm -hmm. would be interesting to me to see if there's a place for instruction or yeah. Yeah, it, it is something that uh, I have been asking uh Richard Schusterman that you said he was coming here mm -hmm. uh next week because of that I mean like John Dewey doesn't have this disruptive and also deconstructive uh, aspect. And he kind of said that he does with him you know, <laughs> defending John Dewey, um, because I, I really think that uh, there is a limit uh, in uh, art and experience when we try to apply it to uh, postmodern art, where most of the things are uh, patchworks and, uh, and quotations and uh, assemblages and, and, and things that yeah, they don't really go together in a fluid way. Um, so that that is, of course, in, in important to, to to know. But there is uh, a disruption, I find, because I, actually what we have to remember is that John Dewey is not describing the arts. He is describing the feeling, in a sense, the, the experience. So, and in the experiences, for example, one of the examples, uh, a lot of the examples that he gives are not nice examples. For example, the the breaking up in a, of a friendship is for him an example of aesthetic experience. Uh, and uh, the the Atlantic uh, traversing the Atlantic uh, with the storm that's definitely disruptive in a sense. So I, I think that what he means by the experience uh, has more to do with the sense that. We and we kind of go and undergo the different uh, aspects of emotions of the experience, and then the experience kind of concludes itself and and makes it uh, so important that um, that then the experience is the experience reorganize uh, all the other experiences. And, and so that's why it was one experience, but not because it was nice or not because it was completely in a uniform uh, way. But um, yeah, but I understand that uh, 
uh, there's something that is there. Uh, it's kind of, uh, yeah, it's a bit classic in Jiwi. And that's why I've been, for example, working a little bit more with uh, Richard Schusterman, Pragmatic Aesthetics, especially uh, his uh, example of the rap music. Um, because now for us, rap is kind of common. And, I mean, my daughter, he, she, she, she now studies rap in school, right? But 91, yeah. <laughs> in 91, 92, Richard Schusterman was writing about rap as being art, and it was completely not at all forbidden. It was really considered as a very political, reivindicative, very disruptive uh, kind of music. Uh, there was no really music. It was really more kind of a reivindication. Uh, so... Uh, that that is also what I we found that it was interesting in his examples that were less uh, kind of naturalistic but more in uh, Richard Schusterman anchored in cultural and aspects um, and difficulties. There is another question. He told us uh, the river besides Jewish quotation. You're using a photo from the Adirondacks Mountains and Rivers. Okay. Uh, ah, yeah. Well, that's a good, a good idea. Because he had... Uh, oh, I didn't... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know where he was. He's... Uh, that's a really, really good uh, idea. Thanks. Yeah, instead of using like a random one. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. I have a question here. Yeah. Um, I wonder what you think about the philomorphic are the yeah. uh, dividing the matter and form from my body to be in your work with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you mean? Uh, what, how, how would I? Uh, I think that your know, work is really connected with the idea of metric and materiality and creativity, and that in a way compared to the artistic and the vision of the actor and form. You know, I wonder if you agree. Uh, I think mm -hmm. you can really go to the other side of Yeah, yeah. Uh... I'm not sure that I'm I'm criticizing Aristotle. I'm very Aristotelian in my mind. <laughs> um, but what I find um, is the idea that uh, yes, the materiality and form, yeah, they can go together much more than in the way Aristotle. Yes, uh, but uh, they're not the same thing. The same thing and form is actually something that I've been working on a lot um, lately because it's a very interesting word, you know, performance, you have this idea of form. Uh, I, I'm working uh, on Wittgenstein's uh, concept of forms of life and life forms. And uh, so what does it mean to form something? And I really think that there is, uh, um, I'm trying to use um, morphological mm -hmm. investigation in uh, uh, gesture studies. Uh, so a gesture is mainly also a type of a form. Uh, and so the analysis of the gesture is above all uh, an analysis of the form uh, that the gesture can uh, give, but not just the gesture, also the relationship between gestures, uh, because that's mainly what goes on in most uh, uh, performance uh, art. And uh, these forms can be completely invisible. We don't see something, but there is some sort of energy or some sort of relationship between bodies uh, that uh, is there. So it's not materialist, it's not material, but it's a form. And what I find that is very difficult to uh, uh, defend is ideas that gestures, and, and that's why I really like uh, John Dewey, uh, is the idea that gestures do not disappear, uh, but they are embedded into our bodies. And uh, because we, in the work of us, but also in our culture, we think that things 
are more durable than gestures. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, if you look precisely, especially with the ritualistic gestures or even behaviors, gestures are very durable. I mean, they go through generations and generations and generations. Uh, and also in dance, and dance studies, you have perfectly maintained gestures that are identical to the gestures they had in in, uh, in the 13th century about some Baroque uh, um, dance because precisely because they go body to body. And so they stay much longer than a ruin from that particular century, right? So uh, material from a materialistic point of view, uh, there is a vital a living materialism. So I'm not really sure that I want to go into vital materialism, but I'm interested in it. But there is certainly a, a materialism of forms of life. Uh, there is not. So, so that's that's why I think that I'm still Aristotelian, but maybe I'm not. <laughs> I have a question. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, the questions uh, actually. The first one uh, concerns uh, Foucault because yeah. uh, while uh, you were speaking, uh, speaking of art uh, as a way of living mm -hmm. your life, um, I recall a Foucault quot quotation that I always um, loved. Uh, in which he says something like, uh, I am fascinated by the ideas of life as uh, a material you can work on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so until it becomes uh, a form of art mm -hmm. or a work of art, work of mm -hmm. life to. Um, make it become a, a, a real uh, work of art. What do you think? It, it's something that reverse your assumption about how the way of life. Life can be a work of art, mm -hmm. something that's <laughs> mm -hmm. Um The second one may be uh, is more challenging for all of us, um, which is uh, exactly, or not exactly, but in your opinion, the difference between gesture and habit in mm -hmm. a pragmatic sense. Mm -hmm. Because this is, uh, this is a, a problem, a topic uh, on which I frequently discuss also with the Jordan. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot see exactly which are the difference <laughs> between gestures and habits, habits of response, habits of action, habits, uh, uh, conditional habits also, mm -hmm. or practices, as you said, which is mm -hmm. the practices of that. Yeah. Is the, uh, yeah, thank you for your very important mm -hmm. questions, uh, Rossella. Uh, so from Foucault, I would like to know where where yeah, it was an interview. Ah, also also to know because I'm sure that she's playing on words between œuvre d'art and uh, œuvre or travailler. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know what kind of uh, terminology he's using. But of course, you know, like a. Uh, um, I uh, I appreciate uh, Foucault's uh, approach uh, about biopolitics and what he calls also la stylistique de l'existence. So the stylistic, uh, yeah, 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 yes. And and I think that he has pointed something major in our culture in our uh, uh, period of. Uh, uh, you know, like how you can actually emancipate yourself from this uh, discipline and control uh, politics that also govern uh, bodies, like he does in biopolitics. But what I I, um, I like less it has been kind of the use of Foucault um, as if uh, we are actually that 
free uh, uh, and uh, because this civil existence uh, could be used or has been used in kind of individualistic uh, um, individualistic uh, behaviors as if one can actually uh, you know choose the uh, behaviors as you change a scarf you know <laughs> yeah, I mean it's not in Foucault but it's more uh, like uh, in uh, some sort of idea of performative or performativity of the self. Uh, and it's not even in Judith Butler, because uh, that's the old main author uh, who has been, uh, but it's really like this idea that uh, um, existence is a style. So I, I actually think that I have a problem with the term style uh, that is so artistically, aesthetically um, he heavily used. Um, so from my point of view, uh, we are much less uh, free, uh, and, uh, and, but it's not really a problem. I mean, it, it is also something that can be securing uh, and can be uh, shared and can be uh, collectively uh, interesting, uh, precisely because uh, the um, collective aspect of it uh, can make us understand better what type of uh, uh, subjectivity. Uh, maybe I can say in another way is that uh, I have the impression that sometimes uh, in, in the kind of post-Foucault use of biopolitics, the behaviors are used for a process of individuation so that we become you know, certain something, right? And that I think that is kind of the uh, main problem is that you tend to want to transform uh, yourself. And from a pragmatic point of view, I think that it does, I mean, it doesn't appeal to me as if uh, it's something that that's uh, um, actually happening. Uh, uh, it has more to do with rediscovering, uh, you know, a very kind of, uh, know yourself kind of Socratic, <laughs> but, you know, rediscovering who you already are uh, instead of transforming uh, yourself and going away from who you're supposed to be, right? But, I mean, it's a longer, it's a longer discussion that one should have, and I'm sure that I'm doing it. kind of summarizing very quickly. And yeah, gesture and habit. Yeah, I also had these kind of conversations with uh, <laughs> uh, Giovanni. And um, he uh, thinks that my uh, idea of gesture is the idea of an incomplete form of gesture. And at the beginning, I was like, mm, I don't like, but actually, it is. It is that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually think that gesture is above all something that is. Uh, inachieved, that it doesn't finish it. That's why I like most of these kind of practices, even if they do finish, um, because it has something to do like a form that is an attempt and is a form that uh, as in need, for example, in his idea of the certain society and conversation of gestures, he talks about gesture and specifically addresses gestures uh, conversational gesture in insects, for example. So that's very not human. Uh, and I like this idea that uh, the gesture is above all something that is addressed, but for a possible response. And this is very interesting because it has the potentiality, um, something that it goes to the future in terms of temporality, but without closing it. Um, as a habit from my from my very little understanding, and you are the expert here, uh, habit uh, is is more complete. I mean, there is something that makes you come back already. I mean, we are in a kind of a return and uh, or a cycle of uh, life forms that uh, uh, it's not really the repetition, but it is something that is more complete or we, we understand it a little bit more. And a gesture is more like fra fragmented, uh, emerging at the beginning. Uh, it can have no sense and there's no problem uh, if it has no sense. It, it can have no reason uh, and there's no 
problem if he has no reason. And even uh, it would be kind of uh, not uh, interesting or not uh, on the point to ask a re the reason for it. Uh, and uh, so that's why I really think that uh, gestures have uh, a lot of resistance uh, to uh, intention and intentionality or, or explicit reasoning. Uh, because when you ask, well, why do you do this? Or why do you do it like this? I mean, I'm really talking about very small and very doable gestures. I'm not talking about all gestures. Um, if somebody asks you why you why you walk like this, why you why you well, well I don't know. Why would you ask? <laughs> so and that and that's for me it has been very interesting to read from um, intention of uh, the book of Elizabeth Anscombe uh, on Wittgenstein uh, and this idea of there are some actions that uh, uh, that are done for no particular reason. And the idea, I think, it is very interesting for the field of gestures. Mm -hmm. So when you do them, the, 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 there's no real production, there's not real reason, but still they are kind of embedded in your body mm -hmm. and uh, doesn't, it doesn't really matter to you to do them, right? Um, but then I also like a lot uh, the soma aesthetics approach mm -hmm. from Schusterman who, in a sense, also is interesting because uh, it uh, means, it kind of uh, uh, makes us also understand that some gestures, repetitive gestures, especially, or habits, can, they can be harmful. So if you don't, if you're not conscious about what you're doing, then you, know, you, you have a back pain, you know, things that, and that thing is nothing compared to all the <laughs> bad, very bad things that we can do <laughs> to, our, to ourselves. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. This may be a very trivial question, but I found it very interesting the uh, passage you were quoted from Marcus X. US, where you will compare it with uh, the function of uh, consciousness uh, to the flow of the uh, mm -hmm. oil. But there is a book from uh, Timothy Spenger where he mm -hmm. compares uh, James uh, to Brad, which is one of his uh, monistic and radialistic uh, enemies. And uh, Spenger uh, devotes many pages to the use of uh, watery metaphors uh, oh. in, um, in James. And it is quite uh, surprising that, according to, uh, to Spenger, also according to me, that uh, James uh, refers uh, many times to the metaphor of the sea, the sea of consciousness, and so mm -hmm. on. It is quite surprising because uh, compared to the image of uh, the, uh, the image of the sea is, has a more uh, monistic or a permanent flavor. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, okay, there is a, also a, uh, uh, let's say, a fluid dimension to, uh, to the sea, but it also contains uh, a more uh, a dimension of civilization of uh, of calm and uh, and so on. So uh, and I think there is something to uh, the uh, metaphor of uh, the siege that there is something uh, of reality. So I what I think if you have something more to say, but please do you think that uh, the aesthetic reflection uh, corroborates the use of uh, the uh, of the metaphor of the river as more other other entity work do I don't do think about also mistakes for example mm -hmm. saving uh, the the image of uh, the uh, of the sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah thank you. I don't know. <laughs> I mean because uh uh Dewey he makes the example of the reader a river in contrast to the pond mm -hmm. which is really stagnating. But then the sea you know, the sea has waves, and also, I mean, if you think about the ocean <laughs> as a sea, it's kind of less uh, calm than the Mediterranean Sea that we're used to. Um, but I, yeah, no, so I don't have, uh, but I thank you because, it, of course, you know, I, uh, it was kind of implicit, but I haven't explicitly said it. Of course, in William James, you have stream consciousness and everything is uh, related to metaphor of uh, liquidity and fluidity and uh, maybe you know this uh, fluidification in the terminology that you find in you and maybe was 
also influenced by uh, James, you know, certainly. Yeah, thank you. I was going to speak about the lane of thought. Yeah. In it's like a erosion thing. Yeah, yeah, I should uh, make like a like an inquiry about all the uh, watery, uh, <laughs> watery pragmatism. Unforeseen possibilities. Yeah. Okay. Super. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, thank you all, bye. and especially mm -hmm. Barbara for suffering. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Ciao a tutti.